Welcome to Hope for Right Now, a Walking with Purpose podcast. Walking with Purpose is a Catholic women's apostolate that creates fresh and relevant Bible studies to lead women to personally know Christ through Scripture. Hi, I'm Lisa Brennickmeyer, and I'm joined by Laura Phelps. We are two friends passionate about unpacking God's Word and applying it to our everyday lives. Each week, we will step out of the discouragement the world provides by grabbing hold of the hope we find in God's Word. Never have we been more convinced of the importance of women being grounded in hope. No matter where you are in the spiritual journey, we pray you'll stick around because God has a word for your heart and his word changes everything. So open your heart, open your Bible and invite God in. Hello and welcome back to the Hope for Right Now podcast. I'm your host, Lisa brennick And I am your other host, Laura Phelps. And I can't believe it. Lisa, we are nearing the end of our Lenten pilgrimage, which is crazy. It's it's Holy Week. Holy Week is here. And so what is Holy Week? Well, Holy Week is the week that precedes just the greatest, most important feast in the liturgical year, the resurrection of our Lord, Easter Sunday. And I don't know about you all, but I love Holy Week because I feel like this is the time for us Catholics to just up our game, you know, like pray a little more, fast a little more, but also to gather together and not only to gather to remember the passion of Jesus Christ, but also to participate in it. And so here in our final week, what we want to do is we want to take a look at Psalm 22 and we want to explore all its different sections. Um, We have titled today's episode, When God Permits the Pain. And I'd love to sort of just hand this over to you now, Lisa, so that you can maybe explain why we picked this psalm for Holy Week and um, what other good things, nuggets you want to share with us about Psalm 22. Yeah, sure. So Psalm 22 was written by the Old Testament shepherd turned king, David. And at first glance, when we look at it, it doesn't actually seem to have anything to do with Holy Week. And it was written around a thousand years before Jesus was born. When we read it, we can recognize that these words are coming from the pen of David, and that can actually be a little bit confusing if you know David's story, because while some of the things in this psalm came from David's personal experience, other aspects of it really didn't. And so he's writing of his hands and feet being pierced in verse 16, of his bones being exposed in verse 17, of fatal dehydration in verse 15. And these are just descriptions of an illness. It's actually describing an execution. And this is not something David ever went through. So what is going on with this psalm? We can find the answer actually in the New Testament from St. Peter in Acts 2. And it's a little nugget that's in his sermon at Pentecost. And in that sermon, Peter referred to David, not just as a king, but as a prophet. So all those years before Jesus walked the earth, David was describing in Psalm 22 what would happen on Good Friday. And he's describing this experience of being abandoned, of being despised, of acute physical distress, and then later in the psalm of a rescue and a celebration. So I would love it if we could all open up our Bibles to Psalm 22, unless you're driving, then please don't. And we're going to take a look, first of all, at verses 1 through 19. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from my call for help, from my cries of anguish? My God, I call by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I have no relief. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the glory of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you rescued them. To you they cried out and they escaped. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They curl their lips and jeer. They shake their heads at me. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him if he loves him. Let him rescue him. For you drew me forth from the womb and made me safe at my mother's breasts. Upon you I was thrust from the womb. Since my mother bore me, you are my God. Do not stay far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, fierce bulls of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions that rend and roar. Like water, 
My life drains away. All my bones are disjointed. My heart has become like wax. It melts away within me. As dry as a potsherd is my throat, my tongue cleaves to my palate. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat. They divide their garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. So let's stop there. It's not all the way through the psalm, but let's stop there and just take a look at what we've read so far. So if you remember from episode 11, we talked about how people who lived during the time of Jesus, how they would memorize. And we had said that many of the Jewish students knew the entire Torah, entire Torah by memory by the time they were done studying. And what this means is that Jesus would have read, would have memorized, would have sung the Psalms. And at the same time, he was the one that many of the Psalms were about. And we can count on the fact that Jesus knew Psalm 22. As you look at Jesus's life overall, one of the things that we see Jesus do consistently is answer Satan's assaults with scripture. And he did this when he was tempted in the wilderness. And then when he hung on the cross, he actually quoted the first verse of this psalm. We see this in Matthew 27, 46. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we know as we enter into Holy Week, that as Jesus hung on the cross, his mind was on Psalm 22. And it's helpful to remember that when Jesus studied Psalm 22, there weren't chapter numbers then, there weren't verses, there weren't titles. And because of this, the first line of a psalm was generally used to refer to the whole poem. And what this means is that as Jesus was hanging on the cross, quoting the first verse of Psalm 22, we can think of him saying, Psalm 22 is exactly what is happening here right now. Which is just so fascinating. And I don't know when I first learned this, but it blew my mind because I had no idea that that's what he was referring to, the, the whole psalm. And, you know, that first verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like, we all know that. It's so familiar to us. And actually, these are going to be the words of the liturgy that we sing during Holy Week. And I have to tell you, Lisa, it was it was interesting. So when I opened my Bible to prepare for today's podcast, I opened up to Psalm 22 and the verse that jumped out at me was a verse that I had highlighted. And it wasn't the beginning part of verse one. It wasn't the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it was the second part, which reads, why are you so far from helping me? And it's like... I've said that, like, I think we've all said that, right? Like, why are you so far from helping me? And I just sat with it. I just like this highlighted verse. And I actually cried. I started to cry because it just brought back a really painful memory to my mind. And, you know, it was it was a time in my life when, I, ironically, I felt like I was at the height of my relationship with Jesus. I have to say, I was involved in ministry. I think I just started working for Walking With Purpose as a regional coordinator. And I, I was also in intense pain at the time is the thing. I don't think many people knew it. And so I know, and I remember, I highlighted this verse specifically because it just captured the depth of what I was feeling at that time, which if I'm being honest, it was it was abandonment. I felt abandoned by God. I had been waiting for God to answer me, and he just wasn't. <laughs> like, he just wasn't. There was a time, and I might have talked about this in earlier episodes, where I went into my church. I was literally face to the ground. Like, my face was on the carpet, and I was crying out for God's help. And there were crickets. Like, honestly, like, I think the pews were filled with crickets. Like, I heard nothing. And I think that, I think that this psalm... And specifically verse one, I think it speaks directly to the abandonment that I would guess so many of us feel. And I make that claim pretty confidently because I travel and speak to a lot of women. And Lisa, I know that you do too. And we've talked about this. Like when we are done speaking, then we get the stories, right? <laughs> like the women come and they give their stories. And um, it's probably one of 
my favorite and, and most difficult parts of going and speaking because you hear it. You hear of the loss and the anguish and just heartbreaking tragedies, heartbreaking tragedies. And all these women kind of come up to you and they want to know, right? Like, where is he? <laughs> where is he? Right? Like, I'm praying. I'm going to church. I'm studying the Bible. I'm even being super nice to that really annoying woman at school car lineup. Like, I'm doing all the things, right? I'm a faithful disciple. And 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 I understand that one of God's promises is that there will be trouble. I get that, right? But, and there's always the but, he also promised that he would be with me, right? He'd be with me in the rivers and in the fire. I won't get burned. And it's like, well, I feel like I'm drowning (laughs) and the fire is burning and I don't feel him near. Like, I don't feel him near. These are the stories that I hear all the time. And it has been my own story. And does this cry of our hearts, he is not near, does it not echo what we read in verse two? I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. And you know, I love that we're doing this psalm because knowing that Jesus, he wasn't just making a statement about his forsakenness, right? He wasn't just up there making some statement that I have been abandoned, but but quoting a line rather from Psalm 22, I think that what we're going to find as we all move on through these verses is that what so many of us have interpreted as this cry of despair, it's actually a cry of hope. And that was new for me to learn. Dr. Suri, actually, he wrote about it in his book, No Greater Love. He talks about Psalm 22. And his remark about this verse is that Jesus's cry from the cross was far from a cry of despair. It was more a cry of hope in the midst of darkness and one that can be great encouragement to us in the trials we face today. And that's why it is so important, and I'm glad we're doing this, that we're going to read, you know, the whole psalm, because although Jesus recited that one verse from the cross, like you said, Lisa, he was referring to all of it. He was referring to the whole psalm. And and if we just stopped with the psalmist, you know, finding no rest— well, then, yeah, this this is a, a psalm of total despair, right? But we read on. We read on to verses four through six. And when we do that, if, if everybody's got their Bible open, like take a look at these verses four through six, because we hear the opposite of a man in despair, right? Yet, and it starts with the word yet, which is so important. You know, yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the glory of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you rescued them. To you, they cried out and they escaped. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. And I love these verses. And when I was reading them, I was like, you know what? These kind of sound like the walking with purpose I declares in a sense. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Lisa wrote just super powerful prayers called the I declares. Basically, they involve praying the word of God back to him, right? So you're declaring the truth out loud over and over again. And so these verses, why do they remind me of the I declares? Well, if we went back and looked at verses two and three, these were expressions of how the psalmist was feeling, right? He felt abandoned. That's true. That is how he was feeling. But in verses four through six, you'll notice we're not hearing about the feelings here, right? What we hear about is the truth. And in these verses, what he's doing is he's remembering who God is and he's recalling the past times when God did show up, right? And then so by doing that, he's actually bringing himself to a point of confidence that the Lord does hear him despite how he feels. And this, Lisa, this is something that you teach so well. Like this has been something I've learned from you that's really been a source of comfort for me in my times of trouble. And I'd imagine so many women that are listening right now. Mm, Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you know, that that's been of comfort and, and it comforts me too, even, you know, reading the I declares and, and just focusing on, on truth, um, and declaring it. But another thing too, Laura, that I just have to say that has just been a tremendous source of comfort to me is, is you and, um, is your friendship. And there's just something incredibly powerful in knowing that you're not alone when you're in pain. Because I've echoed those very same words, God, why are you so far from helping me? And you've picked up the phone and listened when I'm in that place. And 
it's not just a matter of, I don't know, like misery loving company. And it's not just that. Although I do know that, you know, you know, the kind of pain I'm experiencing, I know you get it. Like there's, there is comfort in that, but it's not misery loving company. It's actually something really where there's a transfer of hope. And sometimes maybe you, Laura, have got a time in your life where God has really shown up and you've seen him at work in that moment and you're telling me about it. And at that time, my own circumstances are seeming really hopeless. But then I get encouraged by you and I'm reminded that God is at work, even if I can't see evidence of it in my life. And I just I just want to say to our friends who are listening that for so many of us, when we're in pain, our immediate response, our natural response is to isolate, to pull back. And I think some of the stuff that runs through our head when we do that is that we assume people won't understand um, I think sometimes we think that they'll think differently of us if they knew what we were going through. And we have an enemy who really wants to isolate us in this way. And he's whispering lies to us, saying things like, you can't talk about this. You can talk about other things, but not this. If you talk about this, if you say this out loud, it will be unbearably awful. And, you know, he changes it up. He varies it. But that's kind of the message of what he speaks into us. But that is a lie, my friends. And I am not saying that we talk to whomever all the time about the hard things we are going through, but we need to talk to somebody. We really, really do. And I want to just encourage you in that way to to break the silence and to just experience the consolation and the comfort of sharing with someone who who understands and can hold space for you that way, because it's really, really powerful. But back to Psalm 22. Um, I want to look, circle back and look at verses seven through nine, because in those verses, we're talking about, we're hearing about a different kind of pain. And the psalmist is talking about an experience of being despised by men. So David wrote, but I'm a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They curl their lips and jeer. They shake their heads at me. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him. If he loves him, let him rescue him. And what we're seeing here, happening here, is that the most precious and tender things that the psalmist believed were being thrown back in his face. So this is David writing. This is the same man who described God as his helper, as his shield, his rock, his stronghold. But the circumstances were making it appear that God had no intention of helping him. And so this is what was being hurled at the psalmist when he was most vulnerable. And I wonder if maybe that has happened to you, that your faith in God has been mocked when everything was already feeling so fragile. And if it has, I want you to know that is also evidence of the enemy's work. But what's amazing to me about these verses in Psalm 22 and how they point to Holy Week is that these are the very words that were thrown at Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. So The people speaking didn't realize that they were quoting Psalm 22, verse 8. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders mocked Jesus by saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. And that last line is a zinger. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. If God desires you, if God wants you, if God loves you, if God cares, all these are ways of questioning the trustworthiness and the goodness of God the Father. And that is what the enemy does. That is so an indicator that it's him. That is likely how he attacks you, my friends. He's probably not attacking God's authority or power, but he will attack his goodness. But that, it's that kind of attack that gets us on the heart level. But what the religious leaders, when they were throwing those words out at Jesus, couldn't see was that Jesus was rescuing Israel by refusing to be rescued. He was delivering his people from slavery to sin and death by refusing to be delivered himself. And it's so amazing, Lisa, when you say, you know, what the religious leaders couldn't see. Like, I'm just really struck by the fact that, you know, they're saying the words of the psalm. You know, he saved others. He can't save themselves. They're quoting Psalm 22, 8, and they don't see it. They don't know it. And I just think, gosh, like, what don't I see? You know, good and bad. (laughs) Like, what am I not seeing? That That's just so fascinating to me. What I do see, if I can point out what, what is actually clear to me 
is if we were to look at these verses 15 through 19, that what we're reading is a description of a crucifixion, right? This is the description of Jesus's death on the cross, like so clear, um, more so today and right now than ever as we talk about it. And just looking at it, there are a couple of verses that just, they're heartbreakingly beautiful, actually. Like I want to say like they're so beautiful, but they're so sad. And I think just beautiful verses to meditate on this Holy Week. But the, the first that jumped out at me is the, like water, my life drains away. You know, like you just picture that, like picture water. Like what I see is like there was no resistance, right? Like water, it's just poured out. His life is poured out for us like water. I like this one too. My heart has become like wax. It melts away within me. Because what I hear when I sit with this, what I'm hearing is like the exact opposite of what you'd imagine your heart to be like if you were in Jesus's position, position, if you were being crucified, right? I'd imagine you'd have a hardened heart or an angry heart or, or a heart that's got a spirit of revenge. But he describes the heart like wax melting away within me. It's, it's soft. It's humble. It's supple. It's patient. It's, it's beautiful. And then they've pierced my hands and my feet. We can say that one sounds super obvious about the nails in his hands and his feet, but also that line, I can count all my bones. When I was doing a little bit of research on this, St. Robert Bellarmine wrote something so beautiful in reference to I can count all my bones. He said, quote, a thing they could easily do when his blessed hands were stretched out and the strain on his whole body rendered his ribs and other bones so visible and so easy of counting. Like that just, like I said, like it's, it, it's beautiful and it's, it's hideously painful. And then that final, the final one that gets me, Lisa, is they stare at me and gloat. They stare at me and gloat. And um, something else that St. Bellarmine had said, he said, to add to the punishment of the cross, there was the shame of his nakedness. And I, Like how many of us forget that, you know, we're so used to looking at these antiseptic versions of the crucifixion, whether it's the crucifix in our home or or, or at church, you know, like we forget what he really looked like. And he wasn't only totally disfigured and, and bloodied and beaten and the bones out to be counted, but he was naked. And like that, like when you think about that, that just gets me. That is so, so unreal to me that, that he did that for us. He did that for us. And, and so I, I just found those beautiful and, it, and it's so clear to me, like, well, we're talking about the crucifixion. And now here's what's wild. And, and you've pointed this out to me, Lisa, that in Psalm 22, it's giving us this detailed description of crucifixion a thousand years before it was invented. So a thousand years before it was invented by the Persians and then put into use by the Romans, we're getting a description of the crucifixion, right? David wrote the 22nd Psalm a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. Let that sink in for a minute. Like, that's crazy. That's crazy. And like, you you could go like, well, how's that even possible? And my personal experience is when possible things happen, the Holy Spirit is involved, right? And we know that, right? All scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit 100% inspired David to write this psalm. Jesus then reads it. And like, this is just such a reminder that God knew exactly what would happen on Good Friday. He knew. And Gosh, I don't know. I think that this can be hard to wrap our heads around, this idea that God knew, right? Like he knew the agonizing pain that his son would feel. And I think it's hard for us to accept that because he let it happen. <laughs> like he let it happen. And how many of us struggle with our faith precisely when the unimaginable happens, right? Like when we just can't reconcile with the truth that God knew it. And he didn't just know it, Lisa, right? He permitted it. And that, I think, is really, really hard. I remember when my friend lost her daughter at the shooting at our elementary school. And I remember her telling me that her son, who was a third grader at the time, he asked her, he said, Mom, 
did God know this would happen to her? Did God know? And she had to say, yeah, he did know. And that's hard. That's really hard. But I suppose the other thing we need to consider in these really hard and difficult moments is that not only did God permit his son to hang on the cross, he did, but his son remained there, right? Like he he chose to remain there. Gosh, what you're talking about, Laura, is so is so tender and is so sacred and um because these aren't just distant stories, these are things in our own lives and in our own hearts where um our mind really can't wrap around it, right? Our our mind can't adequately wrap around pain and and I think with all of it, you know, the cry of the heart is why. And we so often don't get an answer to that and we don't understand. And staying in that mystery of of not knowing is is, is super hard. It's super hard. And um and as I think of Jesus on the cross, I I just I'm reminded of the fact that we just we simply do have an inadequate understanding of pain, of the purpose of pain, of the purpose of suffering. We just, well, I'll just say I just, you know, I won't speak for everybody, but I'm trying, I'm trying to grow in this way. And as I think of Jesus remaining on the cross for a higher purpose, that, that does help me. And I think about him experiencing the agonizing pain, physical pain, and then that feeling of abandonment when he hung on the cross. And I think about what it was that allowed him to remain there. My mind goes to Hebrews 12 too. And I love that verse because it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So he had this perspective that he knew his pain would not last forever and that the result of it would be victory. And how did he know that? Well, for one thing, he knew the whole story of Psalm 22. So I want us to hear the rest of it. Like, I don't want us to stop at verse 19. Let's pick up where we left off in verse 20. It says, but you, Lord, do not stay far off. My strength come quickly to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the grip of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my poor life from the horns of wild bulls. So what we're seeing in those verses is the psalmist calling out for God's deliverance. And then right here, we're going to see a significant shift because in verse 23, this next verse, the psalmist is going to start to praise. And he says, then I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All descendants of Jacob, give honor. Show reverence, all descendants of Israel. For he has not spurned or disdained the misery of this poor wretch. No, he does not, my friends, like not ever. He never is ignoring us or disdaining us or just being like whatever with us. No, no, no. He is always attentive to us. And the psalmist says, he didn't turn away from me. He heard me when I cried out. He always hears us, my friends. I will offer praise in the great assembly. My vows I will fulfill before those who fear him. The poor will eat their fill. Those who seek the Lord will offer praise. May your hearts enjoy life forever. He's talking about a feast. That's what we're getting a picture of here. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations will bow low before him, for kingship belongs to the Lord, the ruler over the nations. All who sleep in the earth who bow low before God, all who have gone down into the dust will kneel in homage, and I, I will live for the Lord. My descendants will serve you. The generation to come will be told of the Lord that they may proclaim to a people yet unborn, that would be us, the deliverance that you have brought. If I had any technical ability to do this, when you started at verse 23, then I will proclaim your name. Like I wanted to cue like the rescue music. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I just had this image of like, you know, those scenes in movies where, you know, the couple kind of breaks up and they take their separate ways. And then the guy like has that moment and he turns around and he runs to the airport and like, gets her. that's, but that's how it read to me. You know, like, but wait, this isn't how it's going to end, right? Like, cue the music. I am coming to rescue you because, my friends, it ends in victory. It ends in victory. And Jesus knew this. 
And this really is so helpful when we do feel like we've been abandoned, right? Like in those moments when we feel like we're just kind of hanging in agony and waiting for a rescue that, frankly, we can't see, it's helpful to know, like, no, wait, it ends in victory. It ends in victory. And and like, look, we love our comfort. We love consolations, right? And when we don't feel it, when we don't feel any consolation, I think our tendency is to turn away from the Lord. I love that you pointed out earlier, Lisa, about like our tendency to isolate. You know, like we just love to turn away from like the actual place we should be headed towards. And I think we do that. We turn away from the Lord. You know, and I think like how many of us, how many of us have a good friend or or a family member, or maybe it's ourselves, you know, that's done just that. Like turned away from the Lord because we're just unable to make that shift in perspective, right? To praise through the pain. And I think what we do instead is we turn to things that, you know, keep us busy or keep our mind off of the hurt, distract us from reality, which is the total opposite of what our psalmist does, right? Like we hear it in these verses. Read it again on your own. You'll hear it. He faces the truth. And he doesn't just face the truth. He like names his pain. He calls it out. And this is so hard to do. This is so hard. But I'm telling you, it is not nearly as hard or painful as ignoring it or wallowing in it. And I could say that because I've done both and I do them both really well. (laughs) And so, yeah, I don't encourage that. I don't. What I would encourage anyone feeling abandoned by the Lord, you know, anybody who feels just really hurt, frankly, hurt by a God that, oh, well, we call him good, and yet he permits the pain. I would just encourage you, don't turn away, but turn back, right? Like, turn back. And I so want to sing, what is it, God spell? Turn back, oh man? Oh, yeah, I know that one. (laughs) Turn back, oh man. Way to kill a moment, right? (laughs) Welcome, welcome to the way my mind works. Like, and now it's a Broadway musical. We do love our musicals, Laura and I. Back to the scripture, Laura. (laughs) Back to the scripture. Turn back, oh sister. But really, um, I know what it's like to feel like he's just not there and he's not near. Um, We cannot, we cannot live out of our feelings. We, We talk about that all the time, right? We are not our feelings, but but really turn back and and pray verse 12. Just pray it over and over again. Verse 12 um, is another favorite. It's do not stay far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Do not stay far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. And I love this because here's the thing, and this is another gem I learned from Dr. Suri. He said, quote, There are times we face trials that have no human solution. No amount of money, planning, counseling, or networking can solve it all. No friend, spiritual director, or person of influence can be our savior. The only thing we can do is turn to the Lord like the psalmist did, clinging to God in pure faith trusting that he will help us through this ordeal. I love that quote because I think a lot of us, especially women, especially mothers, we think that we are the solution, like we are going to come up with the solution. And there's another quote, and I'm going to put these all in the show notes by St. Francis de Sales. I think this is a perfect quote for us as we take these final steps through our Lenten pilgrimage. He says this quote, to make good progress, We must devote ourselves to getting over that portion of the path which lies close before us and not amuse ourselves with the desire to attain the last step before we have accomplished the first. So I'll put those in the show notes and I would just encourage you all just just remember, my friends, Jesus, he will not be kept in death. (laughs) We know that he will not be kept in death, but he will rise to life everlasting. And, And whatever the pain of abandonment you feel now, or or maybe whatever pain you've got a loved one feeling, this isn't how it ends, right? This is not how the story ends. It's it's just a portion of the path, right? It's a portion of the path. Keep walking, keep walking, and and do not ever stop turning to the Lord. Oh, wise words, Laura. Just yeah, I'm taking those to heart. And 
As I think about all these Psalms that we've been reading through our Lenten pilgrimage, I just can't help but think how critical it is that these are the songs that are implanted in our heads and our hearts. Because when the phone rings and we get bad news, when the rug is pulled out from under us, you know, when we feel like deliverance just isn't going to come, then we actually need these Psalms to have actually become a part of us, to have shaped how we view God and impact how we feel. And we've got to keep truth at the ready for those times when the lie of the enemy penetrates our minds, lies like you are all alone, or you're abandoned, or you are despised, or help is not coming. And God has given us these Psalms to help us to express our deepest emotions and our needs and our hopes. And so many of them were written by people who had experienced a broken heart, and they are just full of longings, aches of just this plea for God to show up. And they are our words. And I know that I am still waiting for the Lord to deliver me and my family from some difficulties that are acute and that are too personal to share. I know the same is true of you, Laura, and I'm sure it is true of so many of our friends who are listening. And if that is where you are at this Holy Week, if you are sitting by the tomb and if everything just seems dead and desolate, if hope is scarce, if it feels to you like Good Friday will never end and Resurrection Sunday will never come, then I just want to say, one day, my friend, we are not going to need the laments of the Psalms anymore. And I am not saying that this is tomorrow or next week or next year, but one day we will no longer wonder when God is going to come and rescue us. One day we won't need those laments because we are going to be singing the hymns of the book of Revelation. That day is coming, my friends. And one day we're going to sing the words of Revelation 5, 11 through 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And he is going to usher in an age described in Revelation 7, verses 16 through 17, when we will hunger no more. We will not thirst anymore. The sun will not strike us nor any scorching heat for the lamb will be in the midst of the throne and he will be our shepherd and he will guide us to springs of living water and God will wipe away every single tear from our eyes. For behold, as it says in Revelation 20, the dwelling of God will be with men. God is going to dwell with us and we shall be his people and God himself will be with us. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things will have passed away. And he who sits on the throne will say, behold, I make all things new. And that is a promise that we can cling to and we can count on. And cue the victory music. (laughs) (laughs) I want to put this entire episode to music. Can we do that? That's just, what a way, what a way to end this episode. I just love that. I just love it. So as always, we want to leave everybody with some questions for journaling or reflection. And so the questions that we've got for you this week are, have you ever felt abandoned by God? Do you struggle to trust in a God who permits your pain? And so so those are our questions. And what we'd really love for you to do this week is to take your feelings to the foot of the cross. Like if you could get into a church, that would be really fantastic. Um, Just turn to the Lord. And while you're there, name your pain. Like no more running, no more isolating, no more ignoring. Name your pain. And then because we're doing extra, it's Holy Week, we'd love for you to choose a verse from Psalm 22 that just resonates, you know, like what jumps out at you, you know, what speaks to your heart right now. And we want you to pray it like over and over again. In fact, we want you to memorize it. Memorize it, like make it your go-to in times of trouble, because this is where we should go. This is like the perfect Psalm to go to when we're in trouble. You know, so find that verse that just helps you to make that shift from pain to praise. And as a little Easter gift to you, we have created a beautiful PDF 
of Psalm 22. That we'll put the link in the show notes, and I'm sure it'll be in our Facebook group as well. Something that you can print and just keep with you, bring to the foot of the cross, um, just our little, a little something, something for our sweet, dear listeners. So that's what we've got for you. Every mention, of course, is in the show notes. And um, this has just been a real treat to walk with everybody through, through this Lenten pilgrimage. I have super enjoyed it, Lisa. Me too. And I just thank you all for your patience. This this episode ran a little longer, but you know what? It's Holy Week. And I just think giving a little extra time um, to meditating on these things is, is good. It's good to do this week. So let me close us in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we just think of Jesus just saturated with your, wor- your word to such a degree that even in the midst of the most acute physical and spiritual agony, it was scripture that came to his mind. And I just pray you would help us to remember that there is nothing as powerful as your word. And we might, we might use relaxation techniques or the power of positive thinking or other ways that we might want to manage or try to manage stress, but nothing compares to the transformative power of scripture. And I pray that we would live out Colossians 3.16, that your word would dwell in each of our hearts richly. And may it change the way that we think. May it mold the way that we feel. May it provide us with a firm foundation, no matter our circumstances. We love you, Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening to Hope for Right Now, a Walking with Purpose podcast. We would love for you to subscribe, share today's episode with a friend, and leave a rate and review. And don't forget, subscribe to our weekly newsletter. This is where you'll get sneak peeks into new content, special events, and exclusive discounts sent directly to your inbox. Finally, we know how important it is to keep the conversation going. So we've created a private Facebook group exclusive to listeners like you. You can find the newsletter and Facebook details all in our show notes. It's our privilege to unpack God's word with you, and we can't wait to do it again next week. Until then, friends, don't forget to open your heart, open your Bible, and invite God in.